Joining us now on the line from Denver, Colorado, Nicholas Carr. He is the author of The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. He's also a finalist for the 2011 Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction. Nicholas, it's good to have you on the program tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to hear it. We uh, love to quote Marshall McLuhan on this program, not just because he's a great Canadian, but this happens to be the 100th anniversary of his birth. So I want to start there by quoting something he wrote in 1964 when he said, The spoken word was the first technology by which man was able to let go of his environment in order to grasp it in a new way. And I guess I want to use that quote to get us looking back into the history of this before we get to all of the modern applications of the Internet. After the spoken word, how did other advancements affect, in your view, how we saw our world? Well, I think you can, you can trace the influence of technology and tools on the way human beings think all the way back to, for instance, the map. Um, Today, we, we hardly even think of the map as a tool. It's so, so commonplace. But if you think back, back in prehistory, before the map was invented, the way people understood where they were and where they were going was purely through their sensory perception, through what they saw around, around them. As soon as you have the introduction of, this, uh, of the map, uh, you suddenly also have an abstract representation of space, a picture of space. And obviously, there are all sorts of practical uses for maps. But what, what historians of maps tell us is that this, uh, this technology changed the way people think. It gave us, in general, a more abstract mind. We began to pay more attention to the abstract patterns that lay behind uh, what we saw and what we heard. And you see something similar, I think, much later with the invention of the mechanical clock. And here, too, before the, the mechanical clock came around, people's perception of time was as pu purely as a natural flow. When you have the mechanical clock, suddenly that flow is broken up into tiny, perfectly measurable units, seconds, minutes, hours. And what happens again is, beyond the practical uses of the clock, you get a more scientific way of thinking introduced to the human mind. We suddenly pay a lot more atten attention to measuring things precisely and to cause and effect. So every time we have one of these new, what I call intellectual technologies that come along and change the way we gather information or the way we look at the world or the way we communicate with each other, we also see, either subtly or fairly dramatically, a change in the way we think. Let me add another intellectual technology to the list there. Most people like to point to the printing press as one of the most revolutionary developments there. Where would you put it on the list? Uh, I think it's right up there with the most important uh, technologies that have shaped our intellectual lives. And what the, what the printing press did is it didn't invent the book. The book had been around in handwritten form for, for centuries before uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press, but the printing press made the printed page, the book and, uh, and other forms of, of, of printed writing, popular. And as that happened, as more and more people sat down and read books, it in effect trained them to be more attentive thinkers. Because if you think about, if you think about the printed page, its great quality is that there's nothing else going on. Uh, there's just the words proceeding one after the other for long, long, uh, for long numbers of pages, long amounts of time. And what that does is it encourages concentration and attentive thinking, paying attention to one story or one line of thought or one argument for long periods of time. And, and so to me, the printing press is a great example of how a technology can change the way we think, and in this case, make us more attentive, uh, even more contemplative thinkers. And let me bring us now to present day, and by raising the issue of the Internet, uh, that's doing the exact opposite of what you just pointed out, isn't it? I think it is. I, I mean, if the, if the printed, pre, printed page filtered out distractions, screened us from interruptions, and encouraged attentive thought, the Internet, the, the, the network com connected computer screen does exactly the opposite. It bombards us with distractions. And that, you know, that's its great quality as a technology. It's a multimedia system. It, it, it's great for exchanging messages very quickly. It's great for alerting us to all sorts of information. But the downside of that is it keeps us 
uh, pretty much in a perpetual state of distraction, constant interruptions. And as, as the internet has shrunk down to the size of tablets and iPhones and Blackberries, we tend to carry this technology with us all day long. And what happens is we never get any encouragement or any reward for concentrated thought, for paying attention to one thing without interruption. And as a result, I think, for all the benefits it gives us, and there are a lot of benefits, obviously, to the net, I think it encourages in us and in society as a whole a more superficial way of thinking. All the stress is on getting as much information as possible, and there's no stress on thinking deeply about that information. Let's get a little more scientific about that, and, and talk to us, if you would, about what's actually happening either in our brains or to our brains when we're reading a printed page as opposed to a web page on a computer screen? Well, one of, the, one of the mysteries about these intellectual or cognitive effects of technologies is that until fairly recently, we didn't know, we didn't really have a cause. We didn't know why that was going on. But in the last few decades, neuroscientists and psychologists have discovered that our brains are very adaptable at the cellular level. Uh, and that's not just when we're kids, as, as used to be assumed, it's throughout our adult lives. Uh, in essence, our brains adapt to what we use them for, and they adapt to the technologies uh, we use. And, and so the ways of thinking that, that we engage in a lot get strengthened, and those that we don't engage in get weaker. So if you think about uh, when you read a printed page, the, the ways of thinking that are, that in effect you're training yourself to do are the ways that require deep attention, uh, close concentration on one thing. In those types of thinking, it turns out, which, which are hard to do, uh, I think naturally we like to be distracted, but those very attentive ways of thinking are, uh, have been associated with the ability to create deep memories in our own minds, to create the connections between information and experiences that give richness and depth to our thought, to certain types of conceptual thinking and critical thinking and even creative thinking. What you have with the net is, is, is this persist, persistent state of interruptions that short circuits uh, that deep attentive thinking. And now there are some good things about that. You, what you see in the scientific evidence is that the more we use the web, the more we use computers, we tend to strengthen certain visual skills, our ability to keep track of lots of images moving across a screen. But by short-circuiting those more attentive ways of thought, I think you also lose uh, things like uh, deep conceptual thinking, or at least hamper it in, in deep critical thinking and even deep creative thinking. So there's a cost to this constant inflow, this constant barrage of information that we find ourselves processing more and more today. Let me follow up on that a little bit, because I can, I can recall when I first got into television more than 25 years ago, I was always told, if you're going to do an interview with somebody, don't do it in front of a sign, because people will try to read what's on the sign and they won't listen to what the person is saying. Nowadays, if you watch all news channels, they've got, you know, they've got somebody talking on the screen, they've got the weather, they've got the traffic, they've got you know, a ticker tape going along the bottom, they've got the sports scores from last night. They've got six different, seven different things up there on that screen that you're able to pay attention to. And my question is, now that we live in an internet age, are we really able to take all that information and multitask, if you like, uh, with any degree of, um, you know, permanence is too strong a word, but can we do it effectively? Well, the short answer is no. Um, there, there are lots of good things about multitasking, about being able to, you know, have a conversation when we're cooking or something, but the science is pretty clear that actually when we multitask, what we're really doing is shifting our attention very, very quickly among different things. So we're not doing two things simultaneously. We're doing different things. And as we switch our attention from one to the other very quickly, we incur what, what uh, brain scientists call switching costs, which is our brains have to attune, our brain has to attune itself to one thing, then clear that thing out and attune itself to another thing. And as we do this, we become less efficient thinkers on the one hand, but we also have some very other, we have some other negative effects. Uh, the re recent studies show that people who do a whole lot of multitasking, they begin to lose their ability to distinguish important information from trivia. 
what becomes important to them is simply getting new information. It doesn't matter uh, whether it's good information or bad. Just that experience of getting something new begins to be the overriding goal in their intellectual lives. So we certainly wouldn't want to only be able to focus on one thing at a time, but it's also important to, to realize that when we spend all our time shifting our focus, multitasking, uh, juggling lots of information, we do lose some important qualities of thinking uh, that require attention. I guess this is the genius of these new sites like Politico, which, you know, with breathless anticipation will let you know who the newest assistant undersecretary for agricultural affairs in the Omaha office is. And, uh, you know, people are grabbing their Blackberries 30 times a day to get these kinds of updates. At the end of the day, this kind of stuff is not all that helpful, is it? It often isn't. And, and what happens is all of these information feeds are cumulative. So you're not only, you know, monitor, monitoring what, when, what one website is giving you, you're also monitoring your Facebook page and your friends' updates and your Twitter stream and your uh, text messages and your email. And as these things accumulate, you really have no time to be alone with your thoughts and to, to, to think deeply about one thing. And there's even evidence that uh, just the simple act of getting a new little bit of information releases some dopamine uh, in our brains. And dopamine is a pleasure-producing chemical, very important brain chemical, but it's also associated with addictive behavior. And so you can kind of, from that, you can kind of see why we're so, we tend to be so compulsive, even obsessive, in kind of gathering as much as many little bits of information as we can all day long through our various devices. David Brooks is a, uh, I'm sure you know, a quite fine columnist with the New York Times. And uh, let me read an excerpt of something he wrote a few years ago about this. He said, I had thought that the magic of the information age was that it allowed us to know more. But then I realized the magic of the information age was that it allows us to know less. It provides us with external cognitive servants, silicon memory systems, collaborative online filters, consumer preference algorithms, and networked knowledge. We can burden these servants and liberate ourselves. What do you think of David Brooks's take on that? Well, there's some truth to that. Uh, it's, it's a good thing that we have sources of information that lie outside of our own, of our, our own brain and that we can call on very quickly. But there's a fundamental flaw in his argument as well, and that's this idea, and it's becoming a common idea, that, oh, you know, we don't, have to, we don't have to remember anything anymore because we can just Google it. We can just look out on the web. The problem with that is that these external websites and external databases are not the same as human memory. Uh, what happens when we actually remember something is that we connect that information with the other facts we know, with the experiences we've had, with the emotions we felt, and it's those connections that only take place uh, inside our own memory, inside our own mind, that give richness and distinctiveness to our thinking uh, and even to our personality, I think. So when we begin to rely on these external technologies as, as in effect a replacement for memory, we're actually kind of reducing the depth of our thought. And there's, there's evidence that, you know, the more things we remember, the, the better our learning is, uh, the deeper our thinking is. So it's, you know, the mind isn't like a refrigerator if you, if you take out a gallon of milk you can fit in a, uh, a pound of hamburger or something, uh, the, the, the processes of memory, of building memory, are actually really, really important for deep thinking. And the more we have in our memory, the richer our thoughts become. You're obviously coming from a position which suggests that this need for solitary or deep thinking is intrinsically good for us. And I wonder whether, you know, there may be some people who are saying, it ain't necessarily so. You want to make the case for that? Uh, it's true that, that there are people who say that given the speed of life today and the, and the amount of information around us, maybe contemplativeness and uh, uh, kind of, you know, quiet, attentive thinking, reflection, introspection, maybe those things aren't important. And, and I have to say, you know, they're... they're you can make that case uh, at a very practical level that maybe you know maybe that all doesn't matter but it's important if you're going to if you're going to think in that way and you're going to make that case it's important to understand that there that given the way our minds work 
there are forms, I think very important forms of thinking, and as I said, this is, this is uh, you know, conceptual thought, critical thought, uh, very creative ways of thinking that only seem to happen when we shield ourselves from distraction and pay deep attention to one thing. So if we're going to abandon that, we're also going to lose some of these very important and very human ways of thinking. And maybe as a society, that's the choice we're going to make. But what I would encourage everyone is to make sure that we actually want what we're going to get if we go in that direction. In which case, in our last minute and a half here, do you want to give us some practical advice on how we can avoid some of those negative consequences you've just laid out? Well, the easy part is, is giving the advice, and that is to uh, not be so reliant on our gadgets and to give, us, give ourselves time away from that constant influx of information. The hard thing, of course, as, as many of us have found in our own lives, is actually doing that. Because not only do we love this flow of information, but there's increasing pressure on us to be constantly connected in our work lives, in our social lives, and so forth. So I think beyond just exerting more personal discipline, you have to begin changing the signals that schools and employers and governments and, and institutions give and begin to say, you know, it's okay to be disconnected sometimes. It's okay to think deeply and quietly sometimes. And until that happens, I think we're going to keep going in the same direction we've been going. Tell it to the boss, Nicholas. Do you think the boss wants to hear that? I think... Uh, one thing that surprised me since the book came out is I've heard from more and more companies saying they're getting nervous about employees' inability to stay focused on one thing. So, hmm. so we, there is some sense that things are changing now. Gotcha. Nicholas Carr from Denver, Colorado. It's so good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you.